few projects of ours looking for a new site to call home. GSLI's Site Location Network is an exclusive group of trusted communities around the country that assist projects on the move. Our community assessment directors are constantly identifying communities that can help the over 100 projects annually that need new locations and employees. GSLIs, talk to one of our community assessment directors today and see if you can be the next addition to our portfolio. All right. Welcome, everybody, to our next Master Series webinar. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that my screen here is showing. Just give me one second. All right. There's my video. Hey, everybody. All right. Thank you so much for joining us on our Master Series webinar. I am Brooke Edwards. I'm Project Director here at GSLI. And we are um, excited to be talking about the e-commerce climate, what's going on in the industry, how can economic development groups stay competitive um, with new opportunity for e-commerce and the rise in customer demands. Um, economic development groups are really capitalizing on that. So uh, we're excited to have Mike Grella join us for this conversation and we are gonna get started right on the dot. All right, so today's agenda. You guys are going to meet GSLI. If you haven't met us already, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are, what we do, um, speaker intros, and then we're going to go into the conversation at hand as well as a Q&A with Mike and the GSLI team. So if you are new to us and you have not met us before, we are Global Site Location Industries and we solve site location challenges from two perspectives. So we are a site selection consulting group as well as an economic development marketing agency. So we have a very unique uh, double perspective on what's happening in both industries. And uh, we basically bridge the gap between growing companies and those communities that can offer solutions and uh, really meet the needs and challenges uh, and help fix the challenges of growing companies. Uh, just a quick plug, we are going to the IEDC conference in Nashville, Tennessee, October 3rd through 6th. Uh, we are gonna be exhibiting there. So if any economic group is gonna, economic development group is gonna be there, we welcome you to stop by our booth. We are booth 714. And we are excited because we are gonna have LinkedIn headshots in our booth. So if you need a new headshot, I know I might, <laughs> I need a new headshot. Um, I will be getting one myself in my booth. So um, please stop by, come say hi. Uh, we'd love to meet with you. If you're a client, you are welcome to stop by. We'd love to meet up, have a conversation. Um, if you wanna get to know us and our team or our projects, stop on by. We'd love to shake hands and get to know you. Hey, Brooke, uh, at that point, if you could, uh, let's throw up that poll, see who's gonna be there at the show. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to know. If you are attending IEDC in Nashville, let us know, yes or no. All hey, right. it doesn't let me, it doesn't let me vote. <laughs> we know you're attending, Mike. <laughs> we'll see you there. See you there. <laughs> All right. So we will go ahead and close that poll here shortly. So thank you guys for responding to that. And what we'll do is if we see that there are some yeses there, we would love to connect with you and um, potentially schedule some time just to meet up and meet you while we're there. All right, I'm gonna go on to the next slide here. So meeting our speakers, we have Mike Grella. He is the Chief Economic Development Officer with Grella Partnership Strategies. Mike is king of site selection, consulting, um, experience at Amazon, last mile delivery network and e-commerce um, from Amazon. So he is going to share a lot of great insight today on the industry, current trends, um, expectations for the future uh, of commercial development for e-commerce. Uh, we also have Eric Kleinsworge, the CEO and chairman of GSLI, 
on with us to talk a little bit more about his experience with e-commerce projects, share some insights of his 27 years of dealing with site selection projects and um, some trends that he's currently seeing in the industry. And then myself, I'm Brooke Edwards. I'm the project director at GSLI. Uh, I work with a lot of companies that are growing, expanding. Um, I'm kind of in the trenches with our project manager, Ashley klein -Sorge, and we help facilitate site selection projects for our team. All right. So Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, give everybody a good understanding of who you are, what you do, uh, why we've heard your name thrown out there in the industry at some conferences. Uh, you're a pretty big deal. So give us, give us some information about, <laughs> about who you are and uh, we'll get things kicked off. You, you set the bar way too high, Brooke, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to leap over it if I can. Uh, appreciate the introduction. I'm Mike Grella, founder of Grella Partnership Strategies. I've spent uh, a little bit over 26 years in economic development, site selection as an uh, attorney and uh, advisor, uh, most well known, as you mentioned, as a uh, former associate general counsel, director of infrastructure, director of economic development for uh, Amazon.com and also uh, Amazon Web Services, the hyperscale uh, cloud computing unit for Amazon. So uh, spent seven years in Seattle, New York, and DC, uh, covered about over 50 million square feet of e-commerce development and uh, multi-million uh, square feet of hyperscale cloud, uh, somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 10 plus billion dollars of infrastructure deployed uh, while I was there and launched my firm a little bit less than three years ago and really focused on helping communities bridge the gap and level the playing field, provide uh, an insider's view and perspective to site selection, incentives negotiation, uh, preparing sites and industrial parks and communities for what they need to be doing to land that next investment, whether it's a data center, whether it's a corporate office, um, you know, the, the HQ2 is a one in a lifetime event, but there are you know, dozens and hundreds of projects going on uh, in that space as well. But my focus is mostly industrial. I do a lot of work in clean tech, circular economy companies, vertical farming, uh, upcycling and recycling of materials into composites and uh, other consumer goods. And then uh, a lot of e-commerce work on the advisory side, uh, helping some developers and in institutional capital, but mainly focused on supporting communities and preparing them for how to attract and win that next project. Yeah, now's a good time to probably mention uh, we've got a lot of uh, communities here around the country. Um, our master series, if you haven't attended one, they, they're very interactive. We we love questions. Now's the time, you know, to 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 pose different questions as we get to these different topics. If Mike or or us feel it's a good time to answer it while we're doing it, we're going to do it live right there, or we could queue it and uh, save it for the Q and A. So feel free if you've got a question, you've got our ears. Love questions. The more, the better. All right, Mike. So we're going to go ahead and kick you off with just a more general type of understanding of e-commerce facility types. I mean, not all logistics centers and facilities are created equal. There are a variety of logistics centers that offer all different types of capabilities. So let's talk about the most important types of facilities and what, what are e-commerce companies currently needing? Tell us about that. That's a, that's a great question and a, and a great foundation for the discussion. Thank you, Brooke. It is really important when, and this is also applicable to data centers and a lot of types of facilities, when a community says, I want to attract an e-commerce facility, it really requires that qualifying question, well, what are you looking for? Um, and that's because there are so many types. And so if you look at the life cycle or, or like the continuum of e-commerce, it really, it, it starts with the inbound cross dock facility. So when product, when containers get loaded off of container ships and they're, they're full of uh, you know, inventory and, and, and pallets, they need to go somewhere. And they typically, and I'm, you know, I would say not necessarily for every company, but you know, uh, I'll use Amazon as a benchmark and there's others. Uh, a cross dock facility would be located uh, usually not too far from uh, an inbound port where most of that inventory is. And then uh, what happens is those containers and pallets get uh, broken down and then they're put on 
uh, trucks or rail, uh, and then they get sent out to fulfillment centers, and that's the second type of facility. So f- fulfillment centers is where inventory lives. It's where when you order a product online, uh, that product gets picked and packed at the fulfillment center. And uh, we can go into detail about how big they are and, and the different, there's actually like about over a half dozen types of fulfillment centers, but fulfillment centers are what they say they are. They fulfill orders and then they go out the door and then they continue their journey. And typically uh, what they do is they go to minimize the amount of time from the, uh, the order to when the customer receives it you look to get that into what's called the mid-mile sortation center. And a sortation center is where um, you sort packages by zip code, and then they're injected either into the U.S. post office, or in some case, like in Amazon's case, they've got their own network of prime uh, delivery common carriers or 3PLs that they use. In some cases where there are, uh, there's the need for expedited delivery uh, you may be using a, a FedEx or a UPS, uh, but the sortation centers themselves do not have a lot of inventory uh, and they're not very capital intensive. The fulfillment centers is where you're going to see uh, you know, capital investments that in some cases can be as much as a half billion dollars and uh, you know four, four to five million cubic feet for some of the largest robotic fulfillment centers in the country. Uh, but typically those fulfillment centers are somewhere around that 500,000 to uh, million square foot range. The sort centers can be anywhere from uh, 200,000 to over a half million square feet. And then once you get through the sortation centers, they typically will end up at delivery stations. And delivery stations is what we all know as sort of the last mile in the process. Uh, you've got uh, quite a few workers that are working there and they are that last step in the chain where packages uh, reach the customer. And that's where most of the Amazon and other 3PL couriers will take it from uh, the delivery station directly to the customer. Again, the delivery stations, and they're all over the country there, the preponderance of them these days are, uh, you know, they can be 100,000 square feet to several hundred thousand square feet. But what you see is there's usually a a direct correlation to the level of density and the availability of real estate in the denser urban infill areas and how big those delivery stations are. So it's very difficult to, uh, if you're in New York City or or Chicago or Dallas, uh, you you may look to squeeze in 50,000 square feet, 75,000, whatever you can get is going to help with your uh, reducing your variable unit costs for delivery. And then as you get on the outskirts of the urban infill and some of the more rural areas, uh, you'll see larger delivery stations where uh, land, you don't have as much constraints in terms of your ability to expand and scale. So uh, the fulfillment centers are probably the holy grail in the network in terms of what communities look for because they can be thousands of employees. And like I said, it can be hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. And some of them are highly robotic. And then some of them are uh, have very few robotics or not a lot of conveyance equipment. And those get broken down into uh, I'll, two simple categories, which is sortable packages, packages that go on a conveyor belt and that can be put into a tote or a box and then shipped off. And then the non-sortable uh, warehouses are the ones that are less capital intense, less employment, less capex. Um, those are ones where you would have uh, furnitures and tents and medicine balls and big screen TVs, et cetera, um, where uh, you're not gonna be using conveyance equipment. You're gonna be using forklifts and MHE and uh, there's more special handling in- involved. And then the third sort of catch-all category are specialty warehouses. There are warehouses that are just made for clothing, just made for jewelry, just made for high end electronics where they have to be stored and packed differently, that they're fragile, uh, high end goods uh, for the higher end fashion in what they call soft line warehouses. You have to be, uh, you know, the, if you're buying a thousand dollar dress online, you don't wanna see it come all wrinkled up. You want it to be sprayed with perfume and tissue, gold tissue paper, et cetera. 
And so you've got different types of specialty warehouses that are part of the network as well. And so that's sort of the, the, the general overview or the continuum uh, starts with cross dock, goes to fulfillment centers, sort centers, uh, and delivery stations. And then you've got um, you know, some of the other facilities that you know, refrigerated warehouses for uh, you know, grocery delivery and uh, things like that as well. Mike, I, I, I'm kind of a, as a community, representing myself as a community, um, I'm trying to prepare. And one of the big topics I always hear from our projects and things is workforce. So in terms of the different types of facilities, is there a particular skill set, you know, that a, a community could brag about that that would be readily available and um, ready for the e-commerce type facility? Because I know it's becoming more sophisticated as technology increases, which means better paying jobs, those types of things. But what would you say the challenges you've seen uh, when it comes to workforce or what do you want to hear from a community when you say, hey, I want to take a look at your community. What's your workforce skill set skill set? Well, so I, I'm not going to dismiss, Eric, the importance of skill sets, but I will tell you that supply is the name of the game above and beyond everything. Supply, labor shed, commute times, that's, that's I'd say, 85 to 90 percent of what gets you on, on the map. And there are certainly opportunities for rural and less dense communities that we can talk about, but labor shed is really uh, if you are an e-commerce company and you're looking where to site, you do your due diligence. You start with your desktop due diligence. You're looking at your, your jobs EQ and your MZ and state book or whatever data sets you're using. And you're matching that up to your capacity planning uh, forecasts. And you're seeing where am I going to be able to have an ample labor shed, uh, particularly for these larger facilities there's a relatively high turnover rate at some of these facilities. And you need to, if you're investing a couple of hundred million dollars or even tens of millions of dollars, you need to have enough workforce that you could turn over your uh, labor, that you could turn over your workforce a couple of times a year. And 10, 15 years from now, you're still going to have an adequate supply. So when it does come to you know, the skill sets, I would say um, it, if you have a, a, a vocational technical school, if you've got a community technical college and you've already gotten the call and you're already in the running for the facility, you absolutely want to highlight how you can partner with the end user to develop customized training. A lot of this training is done on the job, but it certainly is helpful to work with. I, for example, Amazon does a lot of partnerships with Ivy Tech schools around the country. And so being able to forge those types of partnerships uh, you know, create simulated work environments, being able to train people on how to repair uh, you know, the, the uh, robotics and the, uh, you know, the conveyance systems, et cetera. It's certainly helpful and important, but really uh, that's usually going to come into play after you've been invited to respond to an RFP or you've gotten the call. To get there, you really have to focus on labor shed and in terms of the data that's out there, what I've recommended with more rural communities is that, that they expand their drive times on the information that they have on their sites. Because if, you if you've got, here's how many people live within a, a 20 or 30 mile radius, there are people that are willing to commute in some cases an hour and a half, two hours. And getting an understanding and being able to amplify that message, and get that data out there that says, if, you, if we are on the, in the running or you're able to reach out and communicate that message and say that our labor shed, we punch above our weight. We're able to get people to come. People are hardworking around here. They're educated, they're motivated, and they're willing to commute 50, 60 miles plus uh, for a job that pays $20, $25 an hour with comprehensive you know, health benefits and 401k, et cetera that can be the difference between you getting the call or not getting the call or you winning the project and not winning the project is you know, that some of that marginal data in terms of expanding what your uh, labor shed is and the, and the how willing your workforce is to commute those longer times. Perfect. Thank you. And Mike, I just want to touch on the shift over the next five to 10 years. So obviously as commercial um, properties are starting to get eaten up in the uh, metro areas. 
what does that look like for population growth and for companies moving in? I mean, are you expecting that they're going to need these types of facilities closer in, in these metro areas? Or are they going to start branching out into larger MSA areas? How are they going about finding uh, property locations if they're just, you know, getting um, slimmer and slimmer, as you would say, uh, in those cities? Yeah. It, it, it really is a multi-pronged approach. You know, urban infill is a huge priority for uh, the, the e-com companies. And so, you know, if, if you've got a parking lot that's got a bunch of like school buses on it, don't be surprised if somebody comes knocking on your door with a bag full of money because they can turn that into a last mile delivery station or a prime now hub or something. I mean, the, the multiples that you see on some of the abandoned parking lots are uh, incredible. In in one location in, in New Jersey, um, a certain e-commerce user is paying upwards of 20 something thousand a month per acre uh, just to rent uh, a piece of land and, and put some buses on it. And in some cases, put, you know, uh, put in a, a, a small delivery station that they can fit there. And so, you know, if you're talking about a 30 acre facility getting $20,000 a month of rent, uh, you're living pretty large. And so the urban infill opportunity is certainly important. But what that means is it's driving uh, from a from a land constraint perspective, it's driving the fulfillment centers to get creative and, and go vertical. So they want to be as close as they can. So you know, years ago, you know, when I started Amazon, the fulfillment centers were one floor and they were a million square feet. And now the typical fulfillment center, at least for Amazon, is about 855,000 square feet. And then they go three, four, five plus mezzanines high. And then when you go five mezzanines high, you're at about 5 million cubic feet of space, which is incredible. And so you, know, you, are, uh, you have that opportunity as companies are constantly iterating their engineering teams of like, how do I do more with less? A lot of that is build vertical, get creative, use more robotics. And then another component to that that is extremely important is, is, is parking. Um, you know, particular, and in rural areas, not going to be an issue, but when you get to some of these uh, communities that have minimum ratios for parking and the floor area ratios, et cetera, um, that sometimes can mean the difference between winning and losing a project. There are communities where uh, you know, they've been stubborn on their parking ratios and you know, the end user says, hold on here. We've got multiple shifts where we're, we're three shifts a day. We're running, tw- we're up 23 hours a day. Uh, we don't need the same amount of parking that you think we need. And you know, most of the time, those are, are, are successful dialogues. But when they're not, uh, I have seen projects uh, either not even get to that next step or walk away because parking can't be resolved, which is an absolutely, it's, it's surprising, but it does become a, a, a thorny issue. And that's more so on the suburban and exurban areas where you also, uh, you know, part and parcel of that are doing the traffic studies and looking at, you know, what's going to be the impact on the community of these trucks and, and, and employees uh, coming in and out of the facility as well. Yeah, Mike, and I like you brought that up. We just experienced that with Project Quick Charge. Uh, They moved from Barcelona and we're having a difficult time because some of the smaller fulfillment centers were building all these warehouses and they were available, but the parking uh, requirements for their employee requirements didn't meet. So it all of a sudden the inventory of possible buildings for them to move in was tough. And, and, you know, we had to decide between three, three buildings and they had to end up going larger uh, on the, facility that they wanted just to meet the parking right. requirements. Exactly. Yep. Great, great, great point of validation. All right. So we're going to keep moving on to the next topic, and that is community development and planning. And so, Mike, with customer demand, it's requiring e-commerce companies really speed up their supply chains. So that means from their locations to their mm-hmm. storage requirements and just even the labor force, like you mentioned, um, that they're looking for. Um, and this is now causing site selectors to really consider quite a few factors in this decision. So what is it that communities can do to actually prepare themselves for the changing demands and needs of e-commerce companies and really prepare their sites as well mm-hmm. to be ready mm-hmm. for those site selectors? Yeah. So speed to market is, is just number one. Once you've, 
once you've validated that you have the labor shed, which I would say is sort of the starting point, you don't even get to the gate uh, if there's no workforce. That's and the, that bar can be lowered a little bit as there's as there's more technology that's introduced. But let's stipulate that you've kind of met the hurdle from a labor shed perspective. Now it's about that easy button. It's about land use zoning and planning. Uh, all being on the same page, understanding what those requirements are. I can tell you, uh, having worked with many, many communities, if you've never had a robotic fulfillment center in your community uh, to understand what are the permitting requirements, what are the requirements for you know, electric, uh, you know, for, for the robotics, et cetera, it's an education process and, and really understanding how can we be proactive? How can we Sherpa our end user through the process and, and appoint an ombudsman. Like when you go into a community, and this is just my perspective, if you talk to a site selection consultant, they've got a client. And if they're a true site selector, they're really going to care about speed to market. How do I get my client in the right place as quickly as possible? Um, the the e-com market has actually gone through, end users have gone through, what is the cost of delay if my warehouse is not up and running? on on time if it's a week or a month or a two month delay that costs millions of dollars and so you know if you are starting and ending with an oh i need them and we'll talk about the sentence in a little bit but if you talk to the ops people and the vp of supply chain and engineering and the people that their responsibility is to make sure that these facilities are up and running and customers can get product as soon as possible as it's a cutthroat marketplace you'll almost never hear them talk about incentives. You're gonna hear about, if I come here, how quickly can I get my permits approved? How quickly can I do vertical tilt up construction? Do you have the utilities, you know, the, the, the water, not so much, uh, but you know, water and, and electricity and broadband, and dark fiber, you know, uh, everything we need that we can start building ASAP. And that as change orders come in and they do come in, hey, my facility was gonna be A type, now it's gonna be a B type. It's gonna go a mezzanine higher than we thought, or it's gonna go lower, it's gonna have more robotics, it's gonna be less. You know, to be able to pivot and move at the speed of business of your customer, there needs to be a level of confidence and assurance among uh, the site selector and the end user that your community will be able to handle things like change orders and unique design and change in design concepts. So that easy button, that speed to market, um, once you've got the labor is really going to be the, the secret sauce. And if you can convey that business friendly, like, hey, we're here for you. Uh, we will connect you with whatever resources that you need. You've got a single threaded point of contact. That is all music to the ears of, of the site selector on the e-commerce e uh, projects. Mike, you bring up an interesting topic there. Um, do you find that the e-commerce uh, facilities are seasonal? Um, and, you know, in terms of the amount of production that they output during certain years. So does that drive whenever they're doing their searches? Like do you find them doing more searches at the beginning of the year before, you know, do you find, you know, hot times of the year to be uh, courting these types of companies? It is always a hot time to be courting e-commerce, Eric, but I will tell you that there's an important point in what you said, which is when you get to construction timelines, um, particularly on the facilities that are highly automated with a lot of robotics and conveyance systems and, and mezzanines. If you are in an area that is you know, susceptible to you know, very uh, high cold uh, winter seasons, lots of snow, lots of rain, where um, it's very difficult to build during the winter, the engineering teams for these facilities work backwards from what the anticipated weather patterns and the climate is to determine whether or not, because the, the, the name of the game is being up and running for peak season, so Q4 of a particular year. So right now, if you're doing site selection, you're thinking about Q4 holiday season 2022, 2021 is a wash if you're not up and running. And so for the big fulfillment centers, you need to be up and running by August or September to get your staff trained up, to get people ready, prepared, uh, and then you're off to the races for that peak holiday season where you can have 40% of your revenue 
uh, source to Q4 with all the holiday Christmas sales, uh, et cetera. So what that means is when you're, let's say you are in, uh, you know, you're a rural community in Minnesota or, or Wisconsin or in, uh, in, a, in a Midwest or Northern state that has a lot of snow or a lot of rain. The engineering team is gonna say, I need to work backwards from having a roof on my box by November 15th or December 1st. Because if I don't have a roof on my box, if my building is not covered by that date, I'm not going to be able to build out the interior of my facility. I'm not going to be able, if I've got a roof on my facility, then we're good to go. I can install all the robotics and the conveyance system, et cetera. But you will pass that point of no return where when the weather gets really bad, you're going to have your construction crews not show up or the can't people cancel. You're going to have to pay people time and a half. You're going to have supply chain issues, et cetera. And so it's really important. Uh, there is a seasonality component from a construction perspective of when you need that roof on that building done by. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to do that uh, construction during the winter. Yeah. And to kind of hit on what you were saying earlier in terms of uh, drive times and speed of delivery. Um, and I've seen this um, happen before, you know. You probably want to have communities prepare their RFI submissions based on drive times, not miles, correct? Yeah, hundred hundred percent. And and do surveys and reach out and you know and really take a multi multi community approach. I, I'm working with um, a, a a trio of of communities in Kentucky, and they understand that. And it's a more rural area. They understand they're better together. So when they present their information. Instead of viewing it as one micropolitan area or one county or one community, combining that data and combining that labor shed and then going out 50 miles or 70 miles in every direction from that three, that sort of that joint development authority, joint a multi-jurisdictional perspective uh, really helps boost the numbers. Again, that doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're pulling the wool over someone's eyes. But it provides just a different perspective, and it it really does, in, a, in my opinion, increase your chances of winning. Is when you're able to partner and understand that if we attract a facility because we don't have the labor shed in our county, we're going to be pulling labor from your county and your county and your county. And so that type of collaboration uh, and getting people to play nice in the sandbox, that regional partnership model, which you see in Ohio and Indiana and Virginia and a bunch of other states. Uh, it works well, particularly when you get into these more rural, less densely, uh, less dense populated areas. Great. Thank you. All right, Mike. So now we're talking RFP submission. So if I'm a community and I just received an RFP from the state, from a site selector, or I've been called by the company, what's my starting point? What questions should I start asking? to then craft my submission? Well, uh, I'll, let me just take a quick step back is, you know, there's a, I would argue and really lobby for taking a, pres a prescriptive approach to site selection, sort of pre RFP. Um, for certain communities, ones, again, ones that have maybe have some challenge from a infrastructure or labor shed perspective, you need to know what you have and what you don't have. You need to have done that SWOT analysis and understand your weaknesses and, and, and uh, threats before that RFP comes in. It is really difficult um, to dig yourself out of that hole if you've received that RFP and that you've made the cusp, but you might not be at the top of the list. You may be on that first to be cut or next to be cut. You need to understand what those weaknesses and challenges are. Um, I'm working with one community and before they brought me in, they said that they had lost a project because the company had told them that they had a reputation for, um, I won't mince words, a lazy workforce, a workforce that doesn't show up and that they had spoken to other employers that had said, yeah, you know, I have, not only do I have uh, trouble recruiting. And this is not, I think, unique to this community, particularly with all the stimulus money that's been out there, pandemic. There's a lot of external factors, but 
you don't want to be in that situation when that RFP comes out. Uh, and, and then the company starts to do that deeper dive. They start talking to other employers, et cetera. Uh, so I will absolutely answer your question in a second, but I would say conducting a market study and a SWOT analysis and understanding what your weakest link is, is probably the most important thing you can do before you get that RFP. And then it puts you in a stronger position once you get that call to at least put, you know, I don't want to say put lipstick on a pig, but say, hey, we know we've got challenges and we know they know more than you know. If the community is calling you and you're or the it, it, site selector or an end user is calling on you, you've gotten the RFP. I would posit that they might know more about your community than you do at that point. And so that's why it's extremely important to do that sort of you know, very introspective, uh, you know, cathartic self-assessment of where you are. Once you get that RFP, it's really incumbent on you to understand where this is a process of elimination. It is, it is like a, a playing a game of Survivor or reality TV show. Site selection, particularly in 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 the you know in the ecom space and and also with with, with data centers, you know, it is a matter of not getting eliminated from contention because there's a lot of good places where you can put a facility outside of the urban infill and areas where there's land constraints. Um, there's a lot of options out there when you get into suburban, exurban, rural, and you go out in those concentric rinks. And so it's about how do I stay in contention long enough to win this thing? And so that's where you really start focusing on your weaknesses. You start focusing on labor costs, labor supply, uh, you start looking, you, you look at infrastructure, you look at you know, how bad is traffic going to be? What can I do to mitigate the traffic concerns? And so I, what I've worked with communities is you know, how do we stagger the shifts and how do we understand what other employers are if you're in a multi-tenant industrial park? What are, what are the hours of those employers and how would I stagger the shifts for this end user? So if they come in and they do their own observation or their own traffic study and they go, geez, five o'clock, it's going to take my employees an hour to get out of this place. Um, you know, usually they're smart enough to know that they can stagger their own shifts, but you want to be the ones that to address that proactively and say like, here, here's what we're doing. We're actually talking to other employers and they've expressed some flexibility in how they can maybe stagger their shifts or what can we do to make sure that uh, you know, we address any NIMBY concerns? Because if you do have to uh, you know, move issue or uh, move uh, commute times around. How does that affect local residents? Are they going to be pleased that they're going to see dozens or hundreds of trucks on a you know two lane street at six o'clock at night? Probably not. And so uh, NIMBY sometimes comes up as an issue, and you need to be very candid and understand how do I solve for these issues before either I get called out on them or I get eliminated and I don't know why I get eliminated, which happens quite a bit. Thanks but it's usually that. labor labor and traffic is labor usually, traffic. Yeah, labor, traffic, and then land use zoning and planning are kind of like the three pillars of responding to the RFP that I would really focus on. Mike, and on that, have, have you found um, e-commerce type facilities, do they have certain load times where they're, wherever they're, there's a, a huge amount of trucks coming in and huge trucks coming out. And are they stuck to times like they've got to no. they go at six or do they adjust to traffic patterns? They get they, they usually will adjust to, to traffic patterns and they're pretty good with that. But again, part of that is is you know, engaging in discussions with officials, understanding you know, the layout of other industrial users in the area and making sure that you know, that, the, that you can have this symbiotic relationship and coexist with residents and other uh, industrial users to mitigate those types of, you know, traffic concerns. Okay. I mean, so it's safe to say they're not sending trucks out in Dallas at 5 p.m. on I-35. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. And just a couple for a few more minutes on this topic, Mike, but quick question. So whenever you're responding in an RFP, do you want to present those types of solutions based on the limited knowledge that you have from 
your first initial response? Do you wait for them to come at you requesting for more information, more data, and for a secondary, more formal type of proposal? At what point do you talk about those types of solutions in ways that you're fulfilling uh, maybe some other e-commerce uh, giants' needs in your area that can then correlate to how you can help the company coming in? Uh, I would say that more information is better. And even if it's information that's not favorable, um, you, it gives you an opportunity to frame and contextualize your response in a way that perhaps the end user or the site selector might come to their own negative conclusions without that contextualization. So I always say if they, you know, if they ask 10 questions, I don't have a problem with you, with the community responding to a handful of questions that weren't asked or providing additional detail, particularly when it comes to, to issues like labor. Um, yeah, again, but most of that due diligence is done beforehand, but the more information, the better. You get to control the messaging. You don't want the messaging to control you. All right, so we're gonna move on to the role of incentives. So incentives can obviously be a bit taboo with some communities and some spearhead really good incentive packages while others lead with more about the benefits and assets that they have in their community. When it comes to those e-commerce projects and attracting an e-commerce facility, how important are incentives? And maybe what types of incentives are going to be important to, to really you know, get on a site selector's radar? That this is um, my most and least favorite topic to talk about, and uh, most because I'm most familiar with it, having worked in incentives for 26 years. Least because um, I, I see, um, you know, what I thought would be, and there is some evolution um, happening where there there's more of a focus on, you know, health outcomes, affordable housing, diversity, equity, inclusion, environmental stewardship, um, you know, higher education, etc. Um, you know, those are, you know, those are all important factors, but you still, depending on who the site selector is, um, you know, incentives are, may play an oversized role. And, it, and I believe it's really important for you to articulate, uh, you know, in, in very clear terms, the value of your anchor institutions and your assets. If you've got great highways and great paved roads that cost you a lot of money and they're gonna cost you money to maintain and you've got great schools, the last thing you wanna do is offer a 30 year property tax abatement where you're not gonna be able to fund, um, you know, oh, sorry. Um, sorry about that. I'm gonna to have to fix my camera. Give me one second. <laughs> I was gonna say, we, we we're a little blurry there. We lost you for a second. No yeah, hold on one second. There we go. Okay, Yay, you're I'm back. back. <laughs> all right, give me, all right, just give me one second. Yeah, no problem. And no worries. We want to thank Mike. He is in between legs in a uh, airport lounge uh, conducting this with us. So we really appreciate that. Oh, no, we're, 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 we are. You still good, good on time? Uh, we're, <laughs> you're not going yeah, to no, be no, running no. onto the plane? <laughs> no, 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 no. We're, we're good. I'm actually, I am. Uh, right next to my departure gate. So like they have lounges in, in the right places. So everything lined up perfectly. So from, you know, from an incentive standpoint, I, I really don't like to see communities get taken advantage of, particularly from some of the larger, and again, this is not sort of veiled reference to one company or another, but you know, look at the Inland Empire of, um, uh, in California, San Bernardino in that area. It is the hottest logistics market in the country. They are not offering incentives there. It is not a low cost of doing business area, but yet you've got tens of millions of square feet of space that gets built out without incentives. Seattle does not offer incentives. San Francisco does not offer incentives, yet they're still booming and you have to put facilities there. And so yeah, part of me, the existential question is, well, why would you not for why would you locate in a place that doesn't offer incentives that's a high cost of doing business and then go to a rural community and then get a 30 year tax abatement when it's one third of the cost? And so what is that incentive making up for? Is it because there's a shortcoming in infrastructure and education? And, and is that abatement going to make up, is that cash grant going to make up for lack of a quality workforce or lack of roads? It's actually going to exacerbate the problem. And so I'm all about incentives, but they have to be smart incentives. 
and you have to have c- candid conversations. So one of the things, and, and th- this is not meant as a sales pitch, but one of the things that I focus on with my clients is quantifying the externalities of having an e-commerce facility. And so if you come here and you build a, a 2 million cubic foot facility and you're investing hundreds of millions of dollars, what's going to be the cost of maintaining those roads? How many additional teachers are we going to have to hire, police, fire, you know, uh, additional services that we're going to have to pay for? And so how does that reconcile or pencil out with uh, asking for 100% abatements or multi-million dollar cash grants? Now, I am all about public infrastructure. Love it. I'm all about you know, helping pay for the substation and helping pay for the traffic light and the roads and whatnot. I'm all about paying for employee training and continuing education and uh, you know, maybe subsidizing access to renewable power, uh, you know, in-kind contributions that are made through beefing up your permit department and other uh, public services, you know, investing in smart cities technology and IoT, that's going to make it easier for autonomous trucks and vehicles that are the wave of the future to come in and out. So I would just be mindful of the blank check mentality. Um, I will tell you, if you are a good site and you are a good community, you don't have to um, give way the farm to win. And if you are a community that faces a lot of challenges, I would make the same exact argument. Can you afford to give away 30 years of property tax abatements and your future, because what's going to happen is you're not going to you know, five years from now or when those abatements run out or you don't have that money coming in the door, uh, you're not going to have the resources. It's going to become an underperforming facility. And they do look at you know uh, the metrics of like, OK, what's my attrition rate? Do I have quality employees? Uh, you know, it, uh, am I getting reports of, of, of trucks getting broken down because of too many potholes in the area, traffic concerns, et cetera? So be mindful, be smart, and think of performance-based incentives that have a resiliency component that say, hey, you want a 10-year abatement that's worth $5 million? I'll give you a million or $2 million. Let's take that other $3 million and let's put that into a, you know, a, a, a TIF or a pilot that where those payments are going to be, those payments in lieu of are going to be used for road improvements or they're going to be used for training employees or, or they're going to help with improving the quality of, of the uh, education and putting tablets in, in the hands of the uh, children in the independent school district and, and things like that. And so uh, you know, I, I worked with one community um, uh, that was negotiating on a huge project with an e-commerce end user. And um, I had helped them behind the scenes. I had saved that community approximately $10 million uh, in incentives that were being asked for by the company. And the project still came. And so you don't have to give away the farm. Be smart. Think about it. And if you do get the call, really be mindful of what does that win-win look like and make sure that when you communicate your value proposition, if it's not a cash above the line incentive, that you explain, I'm gonna assign a value to good roads and good schools and good community and technical colleges and a, and a reliable power grid, et cetera. There is a, a value to that and that needs to be conveyed to the end user. Yeah, and I've, in terms of that, I've got a quick question. Um, we worked with the project and they had a one to five year performance, and then they had a five to year phase two. And the incentives that they were looking for would help them accelerate to, uh, instead of waiting five years, accelerate it to a three-year uh, to add the additional employees and to do those things. Do you think, or are there any specific incentives that make sense that, you know, if I'm an e-commerce company, I'm looking for this particular incentive. It sounded like training was a good one. Is there one that they really kind of go, you know, this would really help us be successful, um, you know, in... Uh, startup and, and getting through um, any of the phases that they need to be through. Yeah. I, if you know who your end user is, that's always important, Eric, because if, if you are a, you know, a fortune 100 company seeking incentives, I mean, you've got tons of cash usually on your balance sheet and your cost of capital is next to nothing. 
And so I don't want to say you don't need the incentives, but you know, you're usually concerned more concerned with workforce, speed to market, et cetera. And so when I think about incentives, I think about what's going to make me successful in the long term. Uh, if you are a startup, so there's a, a, a VC uh, back startup called, uh, they're not a startup now, but uh, GoPuff. And they provide uh, deliveries of like snacks and, and food and beverages. And they're very popular on college campuses. So you know, order your, your, your Cheetos and, and a six pack at 11 o'clock at night, and they're going to come to your dorm room. Uh, you know, GoPuff has is, is got, you know, it, got a, a significant valuation, but they're not a multi-hundred billion dollar company market cap. So if you know who your end user are, it is, and you understand their capital uh, structure, you understand what their priorities are. I think that's helpful in crafting the incentives package. If you know that it's a Fortune 10 user, um, you know, they might look to extract the maximum amount of incentives from the deal, but you have to look at, you know, in terms of like your own coffers, what can you afford to give? If you are, if, if you are not flush with cash, you might want to make it more performance-based and say, yeah, we can work with you over five, 10 plus years, but we'd like to spread this out so that we can, can we can collect some of these incremental tax receipts, reinvest in infrastructure, reinvest in education, reinvest in improving health outcomes and, and make the community more resilient. Uh, rather than I'm going to give you a boatload of cash up front and then you've got debt service payments and, and interest payments and, and you're digging yourself out of that hole. So I always try to aim towards more performance based and stretch it out. And it also, the, the other challenge with front loading the incentives, Eric, and this is a really important point to be mindful of, and this is not, it's not unique to uh, again, the, the, the top three or five e-commerce end users, but it, it's actually more of an issue for some of the mid-sized ones is how the uh, VPs and the directors and the plant managers get incentivized based upon the pro forma p &L of a particular facility. And what I've seen happen is that when those abatements run out in year five or year 10, and that plant manager was getting $50,000 year bonuses, and the abatement goes away, now their bottom line and their gross margin uh, and their volume cost has gone up and they panic and they go, well, I'm not going to get my bonus this year. I need another abatement. And now they're going back to the table because they're not going to meet their numbers for the year. And so you know, it, it, people are selfish in how they're motivated to behave. And it, it is not um, unprecedented and more common than you think that the people that manage these P&Ls that it's some somehow their bonus gets tied to the incentives. Never mind how the site selectors get compensated. You don't. You want to have as much as much of that smoothed out as you can, so that people aren't making rash, dis, irrational decisions or saying, "I need more money, otherwise we're going to leave because I'm not going to get my bonus." Now, that's the exception rather than the rule. But I do think we need to be mindful of how we're structuring the packages. But if you're dealing with the if you've got the a pro forma balance sheet from an end user that's not a Fortune 500 that wants to build an e-com facility and they don't have adequate access to capital, I'm all about doing a pilot and a TIF and a taxable or industrial development bond, whatever you need to do to get them. But I would look at how their capital stack is structured to the extent that there's transparency and try to match their need to capital with how you structure your incentives package. Awesome stuff. Good. All right, so we want to be mindful of time because we are about seven minutes until two o'clock central. Uh, so we will just go over briefly about rural and small community competitiveness, Mike. Um, since because e-commerce is focused on being as close as you can to your customers, um, as an e-commerce business, I'm really evaluating all those transportation costs from the warehouse to my common final destinations where my customers' orders are coming in. And since we have a, a large number of small communities on this call and many that you work with, how can they better compete with large metro areas where there's a large majority of customers? Yeah, it, so I would say you know, the, the very rural areas, um, you know, they're, they're always gonna have to deal with the labor shed challenges. And we spoke about that earlier, so I, I won't repeat myself. I would say, you know, again, present the statistics in the most favorable light have infrastructure shovel ready sites, 
the, the an, in a rural community, in some cases, those extra incentives may make a difference. And so have an open mind on that. Proximity to interstates is really, really important. And so you could be a rural community, but if you're 20 minutes away from I-20 or I-60 or I-95, uh, wherever, that makes a big difference. And so I would always tout the proximity to the closest interstate. And, you know, and then also the roads, the state highways that connect your, your available land or industrial park or building to that interstate, did, is that adequate to accommodate an e-com facility? So you are five miles from the interstate, but is it a single lane road? If it's a single lane road, that's going to be a challenge. So you know, think about it from the end user perspective. They are going to need locations in rural areas. But once you've, uh, you know, you've checked the box on labor shed, they're going to say, like, how are my trucks going to get in and out? I need multiple points of ingress and egress. Uh, usually parking is not going to be an issue. But you're going to want to make sure that your your road your roads your access to the highway your access to uh, you know, the state and county roads are going to be quality roads and that they're you know two or three lane roads that are going to get you to where you need to be. It doesn't mean that you you can't compete with a single lane road that's 40 minutes off of the interstate, but know that your end user your site selector has you know, the more rural you get, the more choices the end user has. And so you have to look at that from a funnel perspective. When you get into the urban infill, that funnel is extremely narrative and you have the, the I'll take what I can get approach. But as that funnel widens up into more rural areas, you have to think about what makes my rural area different than my competitors. And that's infrastructure ready sites. That's having the easy button. That's I understand your needs. I can move at the speed of business. Um, and then you know, the workforce labor education component is, is always going to be uh, top of mind. Yeah. And I would think Mike, based on your previous comments, um, it seems like a smaller community might be able to get permitting done faster, less red tape and, and get their, get their project completed quicker. So I think, uh, do you find that as a strength when talking yeah. to some of the smaller ones? It, it, yes. It's reliability and, and that level of quickness is important. Eric. But what I will tell you is you, you, you cannot take that for granted. I have had two client, two rural clients in the last three months where I did an in-market visit and I, I interviewed um, the local CEOs and employers in small communities, uh, less than 15,000 people. And they and some of the local business owners and CEOs said that there's a lack of consistency in the permit department or they move slow, that they've only got one person working in the permit department. That person's on vacation for two weeks and they've got a stack of permits this high that they're working from. And so if you're a rural community, um, it, you need to make sure, and there has to be adequate communication. Um, you could have somebody apply for a permit or ask for information. And if you don't have a good relationship between the economic development office and the permit and building and planning and zoning office, um, that could be your death knell. And I've had communities where they found the permit office or the planning office got wind of a project and didn't tell the economic development office for like 60 or 90 days. Crazy, <laughs> but it happens. And so a lot of what I do is connecting the dots. And I have those candid third party conversations with stakeholders that say like, what are your pain points? And surprisingly, you know, I, I would say generally, yes, but I would not make the assumption that because you're rural, that you're going to move quicker because you might also be resource constrained. Got it. We are about out of time. So Eric, have you seen any questions come in that you'd like no, to? Um, it sounds like we're answering a lot of questions as we go. If you do have a question, go ahead and throw it in there and we'll, we'll address the topic to the best we can. And if not, and, then I feel like uh, we've done a really good job here, Mike. Yeah, I was going to say, we can always pop some questions over to you, Mike, or I can uh, drop, drop your email in if um, someone wants to you know, reach out to you directly. Um, I can share that information. After yeah, the, feel free okay. to share my email and my my phone number with with the team, uh, with the participants, uh, and or forward any questions. I, I'm, I'm usually very responsive. Great. All right, and just as a, um, I'll I'll go ahead and just um, 
get us through to um, meeting our team. If anyone has any questions about Project Portal, about e-commerce projects, go ahead and take a look at the Project Portal. If you have never uh, worked in it before, uh, we do work e-commerce projects. Uh, we talk with companies that are looking for distribution centers, for warehousing, um, for last mile delivery um, centers. So we have uh, multiple projects that if you are interested in bringing those types of companies into your area, I encourage you to go check out the portal and just do a search for some of those companies that are needing uh, assistance with finding sites. And um, these are our team members here. If you want to ask questions, um, if you need assistance, submitting a site proposal in the project portal. Uh, you can work with Amanda Tompkins or Carol Harris. Those are our two community assessment director uh, territory managers that would be more than willing to assist. And if any questions come across about a specific project, I can also help answer those very quickly. And we also, just one final reminder, um, we would love to see you at IEDC, and that is October 3rd through the 6th. We will be there. Um, so if you guys uh, want to stop by our booth, we are booth 714. And uh, we'd love for you to stop by, get a free LinkedIn headshot. And um, I'm putting up a poll once more about um, if you'll be attending Nashville, uh, the IEDC annual conference in Nashville. Uh, we would love to uh, meet with you while there. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And Mike, we greatly appreciate your time. Uh, I know you're about to hop on your flight. So hopefully uh, you have some time uh, to get settled in uh, before you're running onto your plane. Oh, I just got, they just called me. <laughs> Good. Okay. That was perfect timing. Then. Perfect timing. Yeah. Thank you so guys. thank you I guys. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Enjoyed it a lot. You are a wealth of knowledge and we greatly appreciate your time and experience to share with um, all of us on the call. Uh, we've learned so much from you today. So thank you. Look forward to staying connected with you and everybody that participated. Thanks Absolutely. for having me. Absolutely. And thank you to everybody that joined us on the call today. Uh, until next time, we'll see you on the next uh, master series. And we do have an upcoming prospect live webinar for any of those interested in project 3D print. That's going to be next week. September 30th, we'll be talking with the team from 3D Print and um, learning more about their projects. So we'd love to have you on board uh, if you want to bring in a battery manufacturer into your community. All right. Thanks again. I'm going to sign us off. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Have a great Bye, day. Bye, everybody.